Tasmania is one of the Earth's most remote places. Full of endemic species and majestic landscapes, it's a paradise for nature lovers. The island is almost as far away as possible from our home base, but we needed to fly around the globe to see the unique wildlife that has evolved there. From spiky egg-laying mammals with electroreceptive powers, to one of the most courageous and misunderstood predators on Earth, to the cutest living teddy bear who'll never back down from a fight, to high-hopping ghosts on a remote island, this is the wildest island in the world. Hi, I'm Danielle Dufault, and you're watching Animal Logic's Strange Creatures of Tasmania. We just hit the tarmac here in Hobart, Australia, Tasmania. Tasmania, this is crazy. This is about as far away from home as I can possibly be on the globe. Let's go find some adventure. Tasmania is famous for its amazing marsupials. They're all over the grasslands and forests of the island. But high up in the trees hides a fantastic marsupial you might have never heard about. The common ringtail possum. The ringtail possum is hungriest at night. This marsupial lives in tree canopies all over eastern Australia and Tasmania. They can weigh up to a kilogram and are just slightly larger than an eastern grey squirrel. Their prehensile tail helps them navigate the treetops while they search for a meal. Today is the possum's lucky day. A fresh banksia flower has been discovered. It is full of delicious, energy-rich sweet nectar. This is a mutually beneficial arrangement. The banksia flowers can't self-pollinate. Birds and mammals are their main pollinators. After the nectar is consumed, the ringtail possum would move on to the next flower and then head out again in its never-ending quest for food. But being a ringtail is not all fun and mischief. There's a large number of predators after them. In mainland Australia, the red foxes feed on them voraciously. In Tasmania, some of their biggest problems are the quolls. Tasmania is home to two species of quoll. There's the eastern quoll, such as this lovely little fellow, as well as the larger, more spotty, spotted tail quoll. These chonks usually weigh up to three and a half kilograms, with some rare cases seeing spotted quolls, also known as tiger quolls, weighing in at seven kilograms. This makes them 15 times bigger than the smallest quolls. Wolves are the closest living relatives to the Tasmanian devils, and like Tazis, they're primarily nocturnal predators. Given their vast terrain, quolls are quite adaptable and thrive in a variety of environments, from forests to grasslands to jungle to arid shrubland. Quolls are almost all-terrain animals because they're very capable climbers, diggers, and even swimmers. They'll do whatever it takes to find a meal. Quolls are known for eating carrion, but they're also very capable hunters. They'll find all kinds of small vertebrates and insects to snack on. Quolls are also known for eating eggs from all kinds of nests, from turtles or birds. But the largest species, the tiger quoll, prefers larger prey. These chunky cuties will go after echidnas and possums. But they seem to have a particular interest in cameramen. Tiger quolls are the largest carnivorous marsupial on mainland Australia, with their cousins, the Tassie Devils, being the largest in the world. They're called tiger quolls because of their spots, which extend all the way to their tail. Of course, they should have been called leopard quolls, since tigers aren't spotted, but whatever. 
They have large territories of up to 500 hectares and can cover six kilometers a night. Quolls are nocturnal animals and they live in holes in the ground, in dens, or in tree hollows. Because of this, they are quite good climbers, be it on trees or shoulders. Oh. Forever coming in second, the tiger quoll has the second strongest bite relative to body size among mammals, being ousted by their devilish cousins. Tiger quolls use their strong jaws to break the neck of their prey, pouncing on them and biting the base of their target's skull. While tiger quolls get their name from their spots, all species of quoll are polka dotted. My favorite thing about these quolls really is their beautifully decorated pelts. It's very endearing just how, uh, how individually spotted every single one is. Every quoll has their own fingerprint of spots. They use it to identify one another. It helps them with camouflage, mimicking the light dappling across the forest floor between the leaves. Quolls are solitary creatures and only meet up to mate, though they do have communal latrines of sorts where up to a hundred individuals poop. They're thought to have a social purpose for letting each other know who lives in the neighborhood, who they're hooking up with, and what they're eating. It's like Reddit, but with feces. Mating happens in the winter, and like other marsupials, they give birth to very underdeveloped young who have to climb up into the pouch in order to survive. The quoll will breed once a year, and because she only has six teats, she can only raise six young at a time. You could say that quolls live hard and fast, with a life expectancy of only four years, but one of the biggest threats to their survival are feral cats. Eastern quolls, in particular, have faced a hard time ever since Europeans started introducing non-native species, like cats and foxes, which outcompete them for prey and predate upon them as well. And we're going to see a black morph wow. of a quoll. <gasps> oh, that's so gorgeous! So this is a black color morph of the Eastern quoll, and they come in two colors, who knew? Gotta say, this one's my favorite. The black morph of eastern quolls was particularly hard hit by early European settlers, hunting them to make rugs out of their pelts. While they used to roam mainland Australia, they've gone extinct in the region and can now only be found in Tasmania. Despite the fact that eastern quolls have gone extinct on mainland Australia, there are efforts to reintroduce populations from Tasmania. Since 2016, there have been several programs aimed at reintroducing eastern quolls to mainland Australia. The first program was a reintroduction into a fenced reserve north of Canberra in 2016. The program has been successful, and with more recent introduction, their numbers have been growing steadily. They were raised in captivity, with very little human intervention, in a Tasmanian sanctuary to prevent them from becoming too used to people. Then, they were outfitted with GPS collars in order to track their activity in the wild. Unfortunately, the reintroduced eastern quoll started reproducing soon after, and hopefully they'll repopulate mainland Australia and claw their way back from the brink of extinction. Moving on to even weirder carnivores, we head to the forests of Tasmania to see the weirdest carnivore on the island. An adorable ant-eating ball of needles with extrasensory powers. Today I'm exploring some mountains up in the east coast of Tasmania, really hoping to catch a glimpse of some wild echidnas. Our chances might be slim, but we gotta look. Really hope we can find some of our spiky little monitoring friends. Echidnas are one of the oldest surviving mammals on the planet. The oldest known fossil of an echidna came from an Australian cave deposit from 17 million years ago. 
during the early Miocene era, when an ancestor of the rhinoceros was still roaming North America. Found only in Australia and New Guinea, there are several species of echidna. But here in Australia, the short-beaked echidna reigns uncontested. And they will live anywhere that they can find food, from the deserts, to the alpine mountains, to the coasts and the grasslands. Echidnas are one of two extant genera in the monotreme order. They've got some of the strangest morphology among mammals. These guys are monotremes, and what that means is that they lay eggs. For this unusual order containing echidnas and platypuses, laying eggs is thought to be an evolutionary survival strategy. Similar to marsupials, who keep their undeveloped young in their pouches, monotremes keep their eggs in their pouches. But unlike many marsupials, early monotremes found success with a life in the water. And having their offspring safe from drowning in the protection of the egg proved to give them a much higher chance of survival. Today, echidnas have found new niches to exploit and don't swim all that much. But with no evolutionary pressure to change, they've kept on with their unusual reproductive strategy. In fact, many of their seemingly strange anatomical features were commonplace among early mammals. And we're the weird ones for not laying eggs. We were just driving along the highway, heading to our first hotel, and lo and behold, there were two, two echidnas on the side of the road. Also known as spiny anteaters, echidnas have received this misnomer due to their diet, rather than relation to actual anteaters. Their diet is primarily made up of ants and termites, and their snouts are perfectly adapted for this tasty regimen. Using their powerful claws to dig up prey, they'll stick their lengthy snouts into the ground, extending their long sticky tongues to catch insects, leaving the cutest little nose holes in the ground. Their tongues are quite long, measuring up to 18 centimeters, about half the length of their entire body. Since they don't have any teeth, Echidnas chew their meals by pressing them against the roof of their mouths, crushing them with their powerful tongues. But they have one more adaptation that helps them find a meal, a sixth sense. Their snouts are lined with electroreceptors that can detect even the slightest of muscle movements, allowing the echidnas to target their prey with razor accuracy. They are one of the few terrestrial animals that have this superpower. Part of their efficacy on the hunt comes from their surprisingly large brains. Their brains have a huge prefrontal cortex. In humans, this is the part of the brain that we use for higher level strategic thinking. They have a lot of folds in their brains, which suggests that they are relatively complex. Experiments have found that they are as smart as cats and rats. Scientists have even discovered that echidnas experience rapid eye movement while sleeping. In humans, REM sleep is connected with dreaming. What could an echidna be dreaming about? Probably chasing chaos emeralds. I'm gonna try and get a little bit closer. There were two when we were driving by. Oh, there he is. Oh, guys. Can you see that right behind me? This guy's being shy though, he's hiding in the hiding in the bushes. Well, it was just a glimpse, but we've seen two echidnas. So not bad. Echidnas are brimming with curiosities. One of the other traits that makes them near unique among mammals is that their stomachs are almost devoid of acid. Since they have no stomach acid, a lot of harder materials pass straight through them, leading some scientists to believe that they have no stomachs at all, as a stomach is defined as the part of the digestive system that has acid to break down solids. This lack of acid stems from their ancestors' diet, which didn't require heavy acid to digest, and so they stopped expending energy to produce it. 
The next thing on the long list of the echidna's oddities are their eyes. Their eyes are unique in the animal world because they're hard and flat. Echidnas have possibly the flattest eyes among mammals, giving them an insane focal length, allowing them to spot predators from great distances. Their eyes are also very hard, protecting them from getting stabbed by their spikes when they roll into a ball. Those spikes are actually modified hairs and are primarily made of keratin. They are the echidna's first line of defense. He's just staying balled up. He's probably being shy because we're, we're kind of in his, in his way right now. When they're threatened, they'll go into a ball, exposing their sharp spines to ward off predators. Their other option is to go and hide in their burrows. But they're also very good at not getting spotted in the first place. Among all this brush and scrub land, echidnas uh, would actually have very good camouflage. They blend in really well with the ground here. Their spines resemble the scraggly vegetation that they live in, making them tough for a predator to spot. Despite living in areas with extreme weather, they don't really do well in heat. This is because they can't sweat. Short-beaked echidnas occupy territory of about 50 hectares, and will meet up with other echidnas when it's time to mate. If laying eggs wasn't unusual enough, the echidna's reproductive strategy gets even weirder. Males have four-pronged genitalia, and females have two-branched reproductive tracts. This allows the male to alternate, only using two at a time to deposit his specimen in each of the female's tracts while the other two rest. In order to mate without hurting themselves on the female's spikes, the males have fairly long appendages, and they are covered in spines to help induce ovulation. Many males will simultaneously court a female, forming a train, with the dominant males up front. This gives the female several chances to mate successfully. Despite their endless list of mysteries, echidnas are not as rare as you might expect. They have a massive range, and despite threats from invasive species and habitat destruction, their populations are waddling strong. Animals aren't the only wonder of Tasmania. This majestic island is full of beautiful beaches, bluffs, forests, and mountains. Beauty can be found in the least expected places. So by no means at all am I a morning person, but I got up at the crack of dawn today to try and see the sunrise. And from where I am, it's gonna be quite a spectacular view. I'm standing on a formation called the Tessellated Pavement. It's um, kind of a geological landmark almost. It's a really rare phenomenon where just the right type of rock can get eroded away in just such a way that it creates striations. There's salt crystals from the ocean that get washed up gradually onto this rock. And eventually those crystals expand and um, kind of splits that rock pavement and it ends up looking like a checkerboard almost, or a bunch of tiles. Hence, hence the name Tessellated Pavement. But check this out. This is what I came out here for. And it is so stunning. I can't wait to get down there. I need to hurry up before the sun rises too much. Look at those colors. There are very few things that'll get me up before sunrise. This has got to be one of them. It's really cool the way that the water's eroded, or the water and the salt have eroded away this rock. I can't believe what I'm seeing here. Like, I know I keep saying that every day, but every day has something new for me that I never thought I'd get to see. And the more of the world I get to see, the more I understand that we need to work harder to protect it. I think everyone should get the chance to, uh, to appreciate nature in its splendor, as I am right now. I want this to last for generations. I'm just one mortal human, you know? 
and I realized that a lot of people get to see a lot of amazing things but I didn't really ever think that I'd get the chance to do this kind of thing. Despite its astonishing beauty, Tasmania has predators that can be dangerous to you. The deadliest animal to humans is, of course, a snake. The tiger snake is responsible for close to 20% of all snake bites in Australia. Its name is well-earned. Tiger snakes are striped to blend in with the grass, and their voraciousness is on par with that of the largest felines. When on the prowl, the tiger snake slithers quietly along the grasslands, scanning for prey. As it moves, it flicks its tongue to capture the scent trails of the animals of the area. Water is not an obstacle for this snake. It can swim and stay submerged for close to 10 minutes. And like a tiger shark, tiger snakes can catch prey underwater, with fish and frogs being their main targets. But today, this snake feels like eating something bigger. An invasive brown rat is foraging nearby. The snake waits for the right time to launch its attack. Now! The rat doesn't make it far. The tiger snake injects a powerful cocktail of neurotoxins and hemotoxins that paralyzes the rat. Then, it swallows it whole. After the meal, all there is to do is find a quiet place to relax and digest. Thanks to these snakes, invasive rats will always have to sleep with one eye open in Tasmania. But if you're a native mammal, your biggest fear is probably the apex predator of Tasmania. They're the largest land predators and have become synonymous with the island. The Tasmanian Devil. They look like a bear mixed with a dog or with the pouch of a koala. In fact, early 19th century scientists referred to Tassies as bear devils due to this superficial resemblance. Yet, despite the resemblance, they are marsupials and are more closely related to koalas than bears. Tassie devils are the largest carnivorous marsupials left in the world. There used to be the Tasmanian tigers, aka thylacines, but since they've gone extinct, these are the next in line. But they're in danger too, aren't you, sweetie? <laughs> Around 3,000 years ago, Tassies did roam mainland Australia, but they were driven out by dingoes and humans, which either hunted them or hunted out their prey, causing them to go extinct in the region. If King Tut were to have visited Australia, he might have seen a devil roaming in the outback. Here in Tasmania, these devils can still thrive. When Europeans first landed in Tasmania, at night, they heard the ravenous howls of the Tasmanian Devil, a sound truly like none other, and assumed that it must originate from vicious killing machines. Hence the name. Ooh, oh dear. Look at these scrappy youngsters. Are really going at it. Their name is a bit of a misnomer, to be honest because these little guys are all about the bluff. These guys can put on quite a display. They'll open their jaws wide and snarl and grunt and make all kinds of noises. And that's really where their name came from. While they're not as aggressive as their haunting howl may lead you to believe, they do have incredibly powerful bites. Tasmanian devils have the strongest bite relative to body size among mammals and can easily crush bone. Their heads are huge relative to their body size and they have large muscular jaws. Their skulls bear a striking resemblance to another bone crusher, the hyena. They need these powerful jaws because when they eat, they consume the entire animal. Meat, bones, 
sinew, everything. Their bites exude a force of 553 newtons, crushing bones with their molars and tearing flesh with their giant incisors. They can open their mouths up to 80 degrees, allowing them to take bites as big as possible. Now, Tassie devils are scavengers. They get most of the nutrition they need from finding dead animals, but they will also supplement that by finding other small vertebrates and the occasional bugs if they can. Carrion makes up the largest portion of their diet, and they need their bone-crushing jaws to eat all the parts of the carcass deemed unappetizing by other scavengers and predators. With Tasmania being the roadkill capital of the world, the eating can be good, so long as they don't themselves turn into roadkill. So as a rule, Tasmanian devils don't like company. While they are solitary creatures, a meal is what brings them all together. Tazis are primarily nocturnal, and when the sun goes down, the devils come out to eat. There are usually between 5 and 12 devils within range of one another, and in a surprising act of kindness, their devilish howls draw their fellow Tazis to the scene of the crime. The devils pour out of the night and descend onto their meal. Howls echo through the night. They go into a feeding frenzy, ripping and tearing at flesh as quickly as possible. Between the yelps, the sound of bones snapping and flesh tearing fills the air. The dominant males eat first, and they get their choice of the softest and tastiest meat, like the eyes and innards. The smaller devils will have to settle for the less desirable bits, like the tails and feet. But they don't go down without a fight, and dinner time proves to be a good time for smaller males to prove themselves. Fearless, this male, fed up with having to eat the scraps, decides to challenge the dominant male. He lunges, snapping at the bigger male with his sharp incisors. The two males collide, trying to puncture each other's necks. But the larger male doesn't back down. With his bulk and larger teeth, the challenger has little chance. He did his best, but with blood dripping from his face, he'll have to settle for the tail after all. Dinner is a dangerous affair. This battle may be over, but the fighting will continue. Tasmanian devils have no chill. They will continue snapping at each other, trying to usurp the pecking order until the carcass is gone. Devils walk away from feeding almost as bloody as their prey. By adulthood, Tassies become heavily scarred from battle, looking more and more like their namesake with the passing years. Now, I've seen this entire feeding, and they've eaten this entire corpse in about 30 minutes flat. There's nothing left now but a few bones and skin. Because when you're a scavenger, you don't know when your next meal will be. So you have to rely on eating as much as you can, while you still can. The devils are ravenous, and will devour every part of a carcass, leaving nothing but bloodstains on the ground and howls in the air. Would you believe that these scrappy little guys behind me are actually Tasmania's largest predator. They might be small in regards to what we're used to in North America with uh, some rather large predators, but here in Tasmania, everything's a little bit smaller. And dwarfism is most often found on islands because there's less resources, less space to claim territories, and uh, just less room to grow. While their size certainly contributes to their cute charm, so does their gait. You may have noticed that they look funny when they run, 
This is because their forelimbs are longer than their hind limbs. This is unusual in the animal world, but they have these long forelimbs to help them climb. The trees in Tasmania are often very twisted and low to the ground. That works in their favor because they don't like going too high. Juvenile devils, in particular, are good at climbing because they're often targeted by hungry adult males, and escaping into the trees is a handy trick. Not only are they good climbers, but they're quite adept swimmers, too. Tassie devils will swim when they need to cross rivers in their territory, but they also love hanging out in the water. They'll often wade out just to splash around, or to lay down in shallow water in order to cool off and relax. Who knew that Tassie devils liked swimming? Males are slightly larger than the females, and in the wild, they will weigh about six kilograms. Their main fat reservoir is actually located in their tails, and a plump tail is a sign of a healthy tazzy. These cute little pink ears are her tools for thermoregulation. Tazzy devils don't really have many sweat glands, so in order to try and exude some heat, they'll pump blood through those ears, they'll turn a bright pinkish red color, through that they'll be able to reduce their body temperature. Tazzies live fast and furious lives. Living to only five years of age in the wild, it's an intense ride. A mother Tassie devil's pregnancy only lasts about 21 days, after which she gives birth to 18 to 30 young. But she only has four teeth, so only four lucky individuals get to latch on and grow. The surviving pups will stay with their mum for three months after they leave the pouch, becoming independent in the summer. These youngsters are all playing chase, but it's really training for them to become more territorial, defending their dens, defending their young, and most importantly, defending their food. While having such short lives doesn't sound great, it might actually be helping the species as a whole survive. In 1996, a disease called facial tumor disease started spreading like wildfire among the Tassie devils. And unfortunately, it has decimated about 90% of the populations all across Tasmania. In essence, devil facial tumor disease, or DFTD, is a cancer of Schwann cells, which are fundamental parts of the peripheral nervous system. Facial tumor disease is one of the only communicable cancers known to science. The disease starts as a growth around the mouth. As it spreads through their bodies, it pushes their teeth out from their mouths, making it impossible for them to eat, starving them to death. The disease will also grow into their joints, bones, and will cause mass organ failure. It also decimates their immune system, making them vulnerable to other diseases. It spreads quickly through populations and can completely eliminate an entire local population of devils in under a year. The reason it spreads so quickly is that it's transmissible through bites, and biting each other when competing for food and mates is a natural part of a Tassie's life. Symptoms may not always appear right away, and young devils may get it without presenting. They can pass it to others, and before we can do anything, the entire population will have been eliminated. Tasmanian devils were expected to go extinct by 2011, but thanks to conservation efforts here on Tasmania, they are still hanging on. Aren't you, little guy? There is a vaccine, but it is only effective against one strain of the disease, and there are many. In 2015, just five devils were successfully treated. Fortunately, it's quite possible that the devils will be able to beat this disease naturally. Since their generations are so short, they can quickly adapt to circumstances like these. Devils that have genes that make them immune to the disease are becoming more and more common. Scientists now believe that there is a 57% chance that the devils will be able to coexist with the disease. But that doesn't mean we're not trying to help the odds. 
Young Tassie devils who are born in conservation like this one are what's called an insurance population. They'll carry the genetic diversity that might eventually repopulate the entire island. For those Tassies that are lucky enough to be rewilded, it's always considered what genes are being released into what areas to maintain that genetic diversity. One of the most ambitious captive release programs was on an island off the east coast of Tasmania. With no roads, electricity, or permanent residence, Mariah Island serves as the perfect site for Tassie devils. In 2012, 15 captive-raised, disease-free devils were released onto the island, and since their release, their population has thrived. Today, there are over a hundred devils living healthy, tumor-free lives on the island. There he is. Since then, 17 devils have been returned to the mainland in hopes of passing their stronger genes onto the next generation. Mariah Island is not only a haven for Tasmanian devils, but also for a large variety of native fauna, free from invasive species such as cats and foxes. The most iconic of all the Mariah Island residents is by far the real-life teddy bear, the wombat. ferried across from Triabunna all the way to Moriah Island. Now this has been reserved as a national park to be untouched by humans. Now it's somewhat of a haven for all kinds of Tasmanian wildlife. This island was at first colonized as a penitentiary but has since been shut down and for the past 150 years has been preserved as a national park. Considering this hill behind me is absolutely covered in animal feces of all kinds, uh, I'd say our chances of finding wildlife out here are going to be excellent. Have you ever been so excited about poop? I haven't. Well, we're definitely in wombat country. There's a, a little mound behind me full of burrows. And you might assume that mm, these burrows could be any small mammals. But once again, the poop gives it away. Where there are poop cubes, there are wombats. I knew I had a good feeling about this. Right over there is the first wombat we've spotted. Wombats are a family of marsupials closely related to koalas. Only found in Australia, there are three living species of wombat. The common wombat is the most prolific and are found in southeastern Australia as well as here in Tasmania. The other two species are their ugly cousins, the northern and southern hairy-nosed wombat, which are primarily found in Queensland and southern Australia respectively. The hairy-nosed wombat looks like someone had to draw a wombat from memory, but got confused halfway through and drew a possum instead. Wombats are famous for their chill attitudes, spending three to eight hours a day eating. But despite their reputation, in wombat country, things can get pretty spicy. For male wombats, territory is everything, and this male is looking to expand his. The challenging male approaches. The two competitors square off, preparing for an all-out brawl. The challenger backs off, but not for long. The two males slam into each other like knights in the joust, or more aptly, like two stuffed animals being smashed together. They grapple, each looking for advantage. They snap and claw at one another, using their heavy bodies to try and knock the other to the ground. This is Mortal Wombat. In the end, size is king 
and the dominant male stays that way. In a final message of their distaste for one another, they both scrape the ground with their front legs. In the wombat world, this is akin to a death threat. It may be an insult, but it really looks like they're winding up. Wombat combat is serious business. While it may be hard to tell from seeing pictures of wombats, these cuties can be quite large. They can reach up to one meter in length and weigh up to 30 kilograms. Even as juveniles, they're quite large, as I soon learned. I feel like a quarterback with the biggest football of all time. It's quite a heavy, sturdy animal. Um, they're actually very muscular, despite how round they might look. And they put that muscle to good use. While they may look pudgy, they can run pretty fast, as fast as Usain Bolt, for up to a minute. Wombats are herbivores, and they hoover up everything in front of them, from shrubs to roots to hopefully not monopods. Oh, phew. The food that they eat is a lot of grasses and, and plants, so it is very low calorie food. They're not likely to put on much fat, but they are likely to build lots and lots of muscle. This one likes my boot. Oh, I got, you're personalizing them for me, thank you. Huh? Since their diet is made up of vast quantities of hard plant matter, their teeth are constantly being worn down. And so, wombats have developed rodent-like teeth that never stop growing. You can see these youngsters are having a good chew on this log, and that's because wombats have continuously growing teeth that they need to keep wearing down in order to stay healthy. This is a great example of convergent evolution, as wombats are in no way related to beavers, but they both share the same evolutionary strategy. While it's hard to imagine these wombats ever taking a break from munching away, they can survive several days without eating. They have a very slow metabolism, and it can take them up to two weeks to digest a meal. This can be a helpful tool when they're trapped in their burrows, either by a predator or by a bushfire. Wombats are nocturnal and they don't have great vision, so instead they rely on their big leathery noses to find exactly what they're looking for. Low-lying plant matter. Wombats are excellent diggers and come equipped with powerful claws built for digging. Wombats are natural excavators. They've got very powerful claws that they use for burrowing. In fact, they're the largest burrowing marsupial in the world. Wombats have powerful front legs and strong claws that help them dig through just about anything. While you might think that when they dig, some dirt would end up in their pouches, they have evolved to have backwards opening pouches, which prevents any dirt from grinding up their joeys. All that digging has led to some pretty impressive burrows. All the holes to the burrows here right behind me are probably all connected underground. They're so poorly maintained by the wombats themselves, they end up sharing that space with a lot of other animals. Nature's architects, the wombat. Wombats were the heroes of the bushfires in Australia this year because it was reported that they were sharing their burrows with so many species of animals. But that's not quite the right word for it. You could say that a lot of animals were squatting in their burrows during the fires. That would be a little more accurate. Their burrows are massive and can be up to 20 meters long and can have over 15 entrances. A lot of different entrances lead down to the same shared pathways. So they have a little underground network where a lot of animals could cram in if necessary. So intentional sharing or not, good job little guys. You helped everyone. Wombats usually live in the same burrow their entire lives, unless they're forced to leave it. Several wombats can live in the same burrow, provided it's large enough. These burrows make effective hideouts from predators, but a burrow with an open door does not a safe house make. And so, wombats have developed their own version of blast doors. Their butts! You can see how flat his pelvis is and curved down. 
That's because they have a cartilage plate that covers their entire pelvis. It kind of acts as a shield because it's almost an inch thick of cartilage. To escape predation, they'll dig in and leave their butt hanging out. <laughs> their butt is so well protected that nothing can really get through that. Even a Tazzy devil would have a hard time pulling it out by that big cartilage plate. Probably the most famous thing about wombats is what they leave behind, their poo. Their poo is unique in the animal kingdom because it's cubed. That's right, wombats have cubed poo. This is an interesting communication strategy as it allows them to stack their poo to mark their territory without fear of their unique droppings rolling away. Whether you can use them to roll a critical is still to be determined. Eating as much as they do, wombats can poop up to 100 cubes a day. Yet despite this prolific contribution to science, the mechanics behind its production is still a mystery to us. Scientists have discovered that their poo only solidifies in the last bit of their intestine. Their intestines contain parts that are stretchy and parts that are solid, but how it all comes together to produce cubes is still unknown. Scientists and engineers are still looking at the problem because it's a novel way of making cubes, which could potentially be applied in production chains around the world. When wombats aren't eating, fighting, or pooping, they'll be mating. Mating can happen at any time throughout the year, though it's most common during the rainy season. Unlike many other species of marsupials, which give birth to multiple joeys that need to compete to survive, Wombats only give birth to one single joey. Born about the size of one of their poop cubes, it won't be for another six months until they're ready to leave the pouch. Once they start growing hair, they go from very alien looking to incredibly cute. By 15 months, they'll be fully weaned and ready to fend for themselves. Though they will stick close to mum for another few months, as it's dangerous to go alone. These ones here are only about 12 months old. Now, in, in the wild, baby wombats would stay with their mother for up to 20 months. There would only be one joey per mother for about every two years. So a mother wombat would spend a lot of energy and time raising just one young. Scientists are still confirming this, but it's common knowledge that baby wombats are scientifically the cutest things in the world. Wombats are far from being the only marsupial herbivore thriving here. There are three members of the kangaroo family in Tasmania, the legendary grey eastern kangaroo and two of Australia's most charismatic macropods. Let's meet them. Famous around Australia, but little known elsewhere, the patamelon is probably the most successful marsupial you might have never heard of. They're smaller than kangaroos and wallabies, with an average weight of just about 7 kilograms. There are seven species scattered around Tasmania, New Guinea, and Eastern Australia. But of course, our focus is on the Tasmanian patamelon. These adorable vegetarians spend their days hiding in the bushes, and their evening foraging in more open areas. They're notoriously skittish, despite the extinction of their main predator, the Tasmanian tiger. But other carnivores like tassie devils, quolls, and wedge-tailed eagles are still on the prowl, so they stay alert. Patamelon babies are usually born in the fall and are just over a centimeter long at the time of birth. By the time they're five months old, they start poking their heads out of the pouch, but won't come out for another month. When they do come out, they're the cutest little guys. So tiny. Twice the size and with a more rough-and-tumble personality, we have the red-necked wallabies. The red-necked wallabies are maybe the most adaptable macropod in the world, and at different times, they have taken over areas of New Zealand, the UK, Ireland, France, and Germany. They reproduce quickly, eat pretty much any vegetation available, and in the absence of predators, their populations grow rapidly. They live all over Tasmania, where they have adapted to all its ecosystems. But the most striking colonies are found on the small islands around Tasmania. One of them is even home to the legendary white wallaby. 
Off the southeast coast of Tasmania, on Bruni Island, there lives a colony of about 200 albino wallabies. This genetic mutation makes them sensitive to the sun, gives them poor eyesight, and makes them stick out like a sore thumb. Fortunately, their island is free of natural predators, allowing the white wallaby's population to thrive. Hopefully it'll stay that way for a long time so that these little kangaroo caspers can keep Bruni Island as the official home of the white wallaby. Tasmania is teeming with life. There are natural wonders everywhere you look, and amazing species you can't see anywhere else. Thank you for coming along on our adventure as we discovered the strange creatures of Tasmania. <laughs> I love these furry football friends.